Leonardo da Vinci, whose dates were 1492 to 1519, was the oldest of the three progenitors of the High Renaissance and the most wide-ranging of them in his interests. Born in Tuscany, he trained in Florence with the artist Verrocchio, whose busy workshop produced both paintings and sculptures. Leonardo himself would have a restless career working in Florence and Milan for the ruling Sforza family in two different periods. He later spent three years in Rome and died in France, where he was the revered guest of Francis I, the King of France. The term Renaissance man is not a cliché when applied to Leonardo, considering his interests and accomplishments in painting, drawing, sculpture, science, and engineering, including military projects. The rarest work in the National Gallery in London is the Leonardo drawing The Virgin and Child with St. Anne and St. John the Baptist from about 1499 to 1500. It is a cartoon which means that it is a full-scale preparatory drawing that could be transferred to a panel or canvas to provide the final design for a painting. And it is the only cartoon by Leonardo to survive. Renaissance cartoons were rarely preserved because they were literally used up in the tr process of transferring the design from the cartoon to the support of the painting. In this case, though, there are no signs of incised contours or anything else that suggests the cartoon was ever used. To have a cartoon of the scale by such an immensely important artist is a wonder, and I think it is truly the most precious object in the National Gallery's collection. The drawing shows the Virgin Mary with her mother, St. Anne, the Christ child, and his young cousin, John the Baptist. Some scholars think that the older woman is not St. Anne, but St. Elizabeth, mother of the Baptist, who supposedly went into Egypt with Mary, Joseph, and Jesus during the flight into Egypt. The technique here is black and white chalk drawn on eight sheets of paper that were already tinted brown, and then they were mounted on a canvas to support the weight of this large drawing. The surface has darkened over time. One of the major hallmarks of Leonardo's mature style, nonetheless, is his use of sfumato. That means smokiness, and that refers to these blended edges that we see to the figures here that helps to create a sense that they emerge organically from their setting. The sfumato increases the sense of naturalism, for the soft edges of the figures seem more convincingly human than the sharply defined linear contours of 15th century Italian paintings. And it would be instructive to compare, say, Botticelli's Venus and Mars with its sharp contours to the sfumato of Leonardo. The sfumato also adds a sense of mystery as the shadowy faces seem to suggest a variety of emotions beneath their surfaces. The figure group is complex in the arrangement of forms that interlock and spiral around to create a pyramidal shape. And this group of figures is organized in this complex way to suggest the interrelationships of the family itself. St. Anne, and that's how I will refer to this figure, her left hand points up to heaven to recall the will of God and the acceptance of Jesus' fate. It is only drawn in outline here, as are the right feet of both St. Anne and the Virgin Mary. Otherwise, the figures are fairly completely fleshed out. The mountainous background, however, is just lightly indicated behind them. Some think this cartoon represents the original idea for a painting commissioned by Louis XII of France, whose second wife was named Anne of Brittany. The painting that resulted from this commission, The Virgin and Child with St. Anne, now in the Louvre Museum in Paris, omits the figure of John the Baptist. It was unfinished at the time of Leonardo's death in 1519, four years after the death of Louis XII himself. In 1501, there was a public exhibition in Florence of another large-scale cartoon by Leonardo. It received much acclaim, which witnesses the role that Leonardo played in the art world at the turn of the century. The interest shown in this cartoon by the general public, not just by other artists, also indicates the increasing status of the artist in society as a figure of creative genius. 
and also the increasingly open aesthetic response to religious pictures in addition to the devotional response. Recall that Cennino Cennini around 1390 had already insisted on the importance of drawing in the training of artists. Because of the increased availability because of the increased availability and decreased expense of paper throughout the course of the 15th century, more and more drawings uh, by artists survive from this period. However, the 16th century would see the art of drawing raised to an uh, even new height, especially in Florence and Rome, as the very painting, uh, as the very basis for painting itself. The Italian word disegno could mean three separate but connected things. First of all, the practice of drawing. Second of all, the intellectual conception of a composition. And third, the final product, the drawing itself. With the rise of the artist status, more of an effort was extended to preserve every visual thought of an artist. Thus, for Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael, we have all different kinds of drawings preserved. Loose sketches, compositional ideas, studies of figures drawn from life, details for paintings, a few cartoons, and so on. Leonardo's painting, The Virgin of the Rocks, from about 1491 to 1508, hangs near his cartoon. It reflects a composition he had first devised for a painting commissioned in 1483 by the confraternity of the Immaculate Conception for San Francesco in Milan. Two versions were eventually painted. One is now in the Louvre and the other in London. So we have two cases here of uh, one of a painting and a drawing related to each other, Louvre and London, and now two paintings related to each other, Louvre and London. The painting that we are seeing from London shows the Virgin Mary kneeling in adoration before the Christ child. Her left hand hovers protectively above his head, while her right arm rests on the shoulder of John the Baptist, who also kneels, hands held in prayer. Christ offers a gesture of blessing towards his cousin, while a kneeling angel echoes Mary's gesture by placing a hand on Jesus' back. They are located on a rocky outcrop of plants growing out of it, while there are other enormous rocks looming behind them in a mysterious body of water in the distance. Throughout his career, Leonardo made numerous drawings of plants and of water. He was fascinated by the organic nature of the world. The nearly new John the Baptist was later given a cross and a scroll in order to make clear which infant was which. These additions were not by Leonardo. Here we see how sfumato can be created in oil painting, with the same blending and blurring of edges that Leonardo achieved with chalk in that cartoon. You can do this with oil paint since it is slow to dry. Note too the strong contrast of dark and light here, the Italian word for this is chiaro scuro, that help the faces and bodies seem fully three-dimensional. This too was really only possible to achieve with the use of oil paint. Now, there have been arguments about which painting was the original, the version in London or the version in Paris. They seem to have a rather complicated history, and it is entirely possible that the painting that is now in Paris was actually made first. It appears that Leonardo substituted the painting that is now in London for the Paris version with the confraternity in Milan that it originally belonged to. It's not clear whether they knew he was substituting one painting for another. Does this mean, though, that the London painting, even if made second, was actually a workshop variant of the first? And I think the answer is likely no. Uh, first of all, the composition was rethought. It is a variant. It is not the same painting done twice, the same composition done twice. So the pose and the gesture of the angel, for instance, is much less obtrusive in the London version, while John the Baptist also turns out more to the viewer. Also, x-ray studies of the painting indicate that there are what are called pentimenti beneath the surface. Now, pentimenti, the word in Italian means repentances. So something you've decided better about that you regret that you then cover up with another layer of oil paint. And you don't usually have pentimenti when you make an exact copy. You're fine with the composition, you just go ahead 
and show it as is. So that too argues that this really was by Leonardo and his workshop, not just a copy by the workshop. Infrared reflectography has also been used to study this painting and has shown that there are actually two underdrawings here. One that corresponds with the composition as we see it today, largely, and an earlier one that shows a single kneeling figure. Perhaps Leonardo had uh, begun with one idea in mind, thought he might change the composition entirely for the confraternity, changed it and went back essentially to the first version. Cartoons for the most important features, such as heads and hands, were likely used to transfer this composition and then lost. It is also likely that Leonardo's workshop did play some role in bringing the painting to completion, but certainly the hand of the master is present in the London work. Nonetheless, there are still some unfinished passages here, such as the hand of the angel on the back of Jesus or the figure's wings and draperies. Nonetheless, it is really a beautiful and powerful painting, one any museum would be thrilled to own. The second of our high Renaissance masters, Michelangelo Buonarroti, whose dates were 1475 to 1564, trained in Florence and then worked in Rome from 1496 to 1501. In his career, he worked as a painter, sculptor, and architect. In a room nearby Leonardo's works hang two other unfinished pictures, both attributed to Michelangelo in the early phase of his career. One, the Virgin and Child with St. John and Angels, was painted in tempera around 1497. The other, the Entombment, is an oil painting from around 1500 to 1501. I will discuss the first of those, the tempera painting of the Virgin and Child. Pairs of angels stand to left and right of the Virgin Mary, while Christ leans across her lap and reaches for a book that she holds. To the right is the infant St. John the Baptist, already dressed in his traditional camel skin, while the angels above him read a scroll. The painting shows various degrees of completion, with the angels at left appearing only in outline and underpaint, and note that we have that green tone for the underpaint, while those to the right are largely completed except for the further painting of their garments. We think of the young Michelangelo primarily as a sculptor, but he was first trained as a painter in the workshop of Domenico Ghirlandaio. The figures in this painting are so strongly built and modeled with chiaroscuro that they nearly look chiseled from marble, but this effect is also heightened by the unfinished condition of the painting. If there was a sense of sweet mystery in Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks, we sense here instead the forceful character of the Virgin and Child and her restrained meditative mood. While tempera paint was by 1500 already beginning to seem a little old-fashioned, Ghirlandaio's shop still worked with it frequently. Michelangelo seems to have worked from right to left with this painting, leaving some area still incomplete that he would return to, but never did. The question remains, why abandon the work in this state? That is impossible to explain fully, but it is true that both Michelangelo and Leonardo would become well known for their reluctance, even inability, to bring many projects to completion. Either they were tempted away by other projects or they believed that they had not achieved what they had hoped to do at the start. This possible sense of dissatisfaction that artists felt at the reality of their creation as opposed to their internal and perfect vision of what they wanted to achieve suggests the greater demands that the concept of genius that was evolving at this very time played, uh, placed on those who this word was applied to. It also suggests that some artists saw themselves as the true owners of their works, no matter who the patrons of them were, and that only they were the ones that could decide whether a work was finished or not, or whether it should even be finished. To have such in unfinished works preserved for us offers a tremendous opportunity to see the painter's engagement and sometimes even struggle with their task. The third of the great artists of the High Renaissance in central Italy was Raffaello Santi, called Raphael in English. His dates, 1483 to 1520. Though he only lived 37 years, he was incredibly productive and influential. Born in Urbino, where his father was court painter and a poet, 
Raphael's early years were spent in Urbino, Siena, and Perugia, which was another important regional art center. Raphael's fame first came in Florence in the early 16th century. From 1508, he was in Rome, where he worked for the papacy and other patrons at the highest level of Roman society. The National Gallery has a strong selection of 10 of his paintings, dating especially from his pre-Roman period. Uh, but they also have a great portrait of his primary Roman patron, Pope Julius II. The Ansa Dei Madonna is from 1505 and might best be thought of as the early 16th century equivalent to Masaccio's Virgin and Child from 1426, The Virgin and Child Enthroned. The lessons of how to compose a scene using linear perspective and how to light a scene consistently that Masaccio helped to introduce were now second nature to an artist like Raphael. He has added to this a superb ability to work with oil paint to achieve rich, lustrous colors and illusionistic effects, and a sense of grandeur that helps to create an elevated yet serene religious scene. The painting was probably commissioned by Niccolò Ansede for his family chapel in San Fiorenzo in Perugia. The chapel was dedicated to St. Nicholas of Bari, who is shown at the right of the painting. St. Nicholas of Bari was a 4th century saint and bishop, and he is indeed the Saint Nick that we refer to at Christmas time. To the left of the throne is St. John the Baptist. These saints have additional meaning as the name saints for the patron, Niccolo, and his eldest son, Giovanni Battista. The virgin and child sit on a massive throne that is raised up on a plinth or pedestal and covered with a canopy. Behind the throne and saints is an archway that meets a barrel vault covering the space while a view outdoors appears to either side of the throne. Notice how important symmetrical compositions are for high Renaissance art. Raphael was always a quick study and he was fascinated by Leonardo's innovations. The figures show the effects of Leonardo's use of sfumato in the softened contours and the very careful and expressive shading. However, Raphael's paintings do not typically evoke the same sense of mystery as Leonardo's. Harmony, gracefulness, and balance were the hallmarks instead of Raphael's style throughout his career, and these qualities epitomize this painting as well. The sense of balance was created in part by the rigorous organization of the two-dimensional design of the painting, in addition to the careful linear perspective construction. In fact, a nine-square grid was incised onto the gesso ground that helped Raphael create a composition that was organized around a surface design that divided the space into thirds horizontally and vertically. Yet Raphael was also confident enough to change the composition when the painting was well underway. Thus, the archway, barrel vault, and parapet were all added on top of the landscape and sky view in the background. So he painted it out completely with more of a landscape and then painted the architecture over it. The Madonna and Child with the Infant Baptist, called the Garva Madonna for a previous owner from about 1509 to 10, also suggests Raphael's confident absorption of Leonardo's lessons in the spiraling pyramidal figure group and the sfumato. You may have already noticed that we have a reproduction of this Raphael painting hanging here. It is a particularly fine representation of high Renaissance compositional art. The Virgin and Child, uh, often shown with the infant John the Baptist, was a well-established theme in Raphael's art by the time he arrived in Rome in 1508. While much of his time there was devoted to large-scale projects, such as decoration of the Pope's official rooms in the Vatican Palace, Raphael did still find time to paint some depictions of this popular devotional subject for high-level patrons. Here the infant Jesus rests on his mother's lap and reaches across her to take a carnation that is held by his cousin John the Baptist for him to grab. The carnation is a symbol of Christ's passion and death, which here Christ takes on willingly. Meanwhile, the Virgin Mary, her body facing to her right, turns her gaze to her left and grasps John's camel skin garment with her left hand. 
Her right hand holds up her mantle protectively behind the figure of her son. In this way, she really encompasses the figures very protectively. Raphael painted this work in thin layers of oil paint, which over time have become more transparent, allowing the viewer to see parts of the underdrawing without any technological assistance. But the full study of the underdrawing is revealed with infrared reflectography shows even more, of course. It is clear here that Raphael used metal point and not chalk, charcoal, or ink to make this underdrawing. A metal point drawing is made by attaching a metal wire, in this case an alloy of lead and tin, to a holder, and then you hold that like a pencil or charcoal. Metal point makes a soft, gray, and indelible line. It was best used by a very confident artist. Just as the Ansidae Madonna was divided around thirds, the Garva Madonna was divided on the surface into quarters, clearly set out in the underdrawing. Here the hand of John the Baptist falls just below and that of Jesus just above the direct center of the composition. This helps to draw our eyes to this point and highlights the symbolic importance of what otherwise looks like just an anecdotal motif. Seeing the ruled divisions on the panel's ground also makes clear how carefully Raphael positioned the Virgin's head to emphasize symmetry despite the twist of her body. A sketchbook from this period shows many quick studies for various compositions of the Virgin and Child by Raphael, some of them including John the Baptist. It is likely that Raphael worked out this composition in a careful preparatory drawing, but the evidence of the underdrawing is that the composition was drawn freehand there, not transferred with a cartoon. It is both a confident drawing on its own and one that indicates rethinking of his ideas. Here, too, he changed the background, though in this case, while still at the underdrawing stage, not at the stage of painting. The wide pier behind the Virgin Mary was drawn over earlier forms that showed a continuous landscape behind the figures. What looks on the surface so inevitable now and perfect was the result, therefore, of both planning and innovation. The technology of infrared reflectography has been an unparalleled asset in understanding the genesis of Renaissance paintings, as long as they were underdrawn with uh, carbon-based substances that we can see with this technique. Here we have the added bonus of seeing an intentionally long-lost drawing by Raphael emerge through infrared reflectography, one that has the same confidence and grace as the finished painting. For the 19th century museum director, connoisseur, and art historian, Raphael was the quintessential Renaissance artist, and his works were the most desirable to obtain of any of the old masters of Europe. Thus, the fate of his portrait of Pope Julius II from mid-1511 is an intriguing one. It was the first Raphael painting to enter the National Gallery at its very beginnings with the Angerstein Collection, in 1824. However, it was not the only version of this composition to survive, and soon some scholars came to believe that a version in the Uffizi Museum in Florence was the original and that the London painting was a workshop replica. However, a thorough cleaning in 1970 revealed a number of significant pentimenti, those repentances, that almost always indicate an original version. Since 1970, therefore, the National Gallery portrait has received pride of place over the Uffizi version. That is now considered the copy. The major changes don't concern the figure in this case, but the background. Originally, crossed keys, a symbol of the papacy and the papal tiara, had originally been painted as the backdrop, but then were painted over by the green curtain. Once more, the thinning of paint layers over time has allowed uh, lower layers to come through more clearly, and the shape of this earlier design can now be made out with the unaided eye. The Uffizi version, on the other hand, has this green curtain with no sign of an earlier design underneath it. Julius II, born Giuliano della Rovere, was pope from 1503 to 1513 and was famed as both an extraordinary art patron and a fierce defender of the papacy as a secular political power. His Della Rovere ancestry is referred to in the acorns that are carved into the chair on which he sits. Rovere means oak in Italian. 
Julius II was only bearded for one and a half years from late 1510 until early 1513. He had grown the beard when ill after the papal city of Bologna was captured by French troops and shaved it off when the situation began to look better for the papal struggle in March 1513. He had only returned to Rome in late June 1511, the earliest date the Pope could have sat for this portrait. Earlier papal portraits showed either a frontal or profile view. This seated three-quarters view and three-quarters length composition would set a new standard adhered to through the 17th century. And with the expanded composition comes expanded size as well. Everything is really larger about this conception. Raphael managed a tricky feat here. He paid homage to this worldly man's taste for luxury through the gorgeous representation of the rich coloring of the traditional papal garb, of the red velvet cap lined with ermine and the velvet stole, and the characterization of the person himself, a powerful, intense man, Raphael's best patron, who was near the end of his turbulent life. The deep chiaroscuro used to characterize the face here suggests the contradiction and the fatigue of the Pope who left the papacy more powerful but spiritually poorer. The role of portraiture has expanded with Raphael to suggest character, not just appearance, class, or role. Both a cartoon for the whole composition and a same-size drawing of the head of Julius II survive. They appear to be workshop productions made from the finished portrait and could be used for other images, as, for example, the Uffizi copy. One last painting deserves a brief mention by an artist who is less well-known today but was considered Raphael's main rival in Rome as a painter of altarpieces. Sebastiano del Piombo also holds a further distinction. His painting, The Raising of Lazarus, made from about 1517 to 1519, was officially the very first painting to enter the National Gallery and holds the acquisition number of NG1. Sebastiano Luciani, whose dates were about 1485 to 1547, was a Venetian painter trained by Giovanni Bellini and possibly by Giorgione, whom we will turn to in the next lecture. He was in Rome by 1511 and was befriended by Michelangelo. He later became a papal official in the office of the sealer of briefs during the papacy of Clement VII, who was the former cardinal Giulio de' Medici. The leaden seal for this office was called a Piombo, and this is where he gets his nickname of Sebastiano del Piombo. In 1516, before he became Pope, Giulio de' Medici ordered large-scale altarpieces from both Sebastiano and Raphael, intended to go to the Cathedral of Narbonne, France, where he was Archbishop. Raphael's painting, The Transfiguration, and Sebastiano's Raising of Lazarus were exhibited publicly in Rome in April 1520, six days after the premature death of Raphael. The Transfiguration remained in Rome and later entered the Vatican Gallery. Sebastiano's painting was sent to Narbonne and remained in the cathedral until the early 18th century. Later in that century, it was transferred from its original wooden panel to a canvas support and suffered in that transfer with paint loss from the surface. The subject is taken from the Book of John and relates one of the miracles of Jesus' ministry, when he raised from the dead Lazarus, brother of Mary and Martha, two of the followers of Jesus. Here Jesus is a commanding figure in blue and red, the red has now faded to pink, who has physically willed Lazarus to rise from the dead after four days, a prefiguration of his own resurrection. He has now just ordered the bystanders to unwrap Lazarus from his grave clothes. The muscular Lazarus sits aided by a man in the right foreground while Mary Magdalene kneels in supplication nearby. The composition is crowded with many other figures who pray, point, converse, or just gaze at the scene taking place. The subject was linked with the site. Relics of Lazarus were in Narbonne at the cathedral. Some of the grandeur of these large-scale figures may be due to the assistance of Michelangelo, who is said to have provided drawings for Sebastiano for this work. Michelangelo felt real antipathy towards Raphael, and in this competition certainly would have wanted Sebastiano to win. 
Sebastiano, though, combined these Michelangelo figures with a Venetian-style landscape that accents the dramatic mood. It is an exciting painting in its scale, coloring, and poses, and offers the kind of compositional dynamism that would characterize much 16th century art. Any discussion of Sebastiano del Piombo needs to consider the source of his rich color and brushwork in 16th century Venetian painting, and it is to that subject that we will turn in the next lecture.